What is up, everybody? Mr. Purse here. Welcome to 6.3. This topic is on imperialism. We're doing imperialism in sub-Saharan Africa. By the way, sub-Saharan Africa just refers to the area beneath sub the Sahara Desert in Africa. So it's a large landmass, large piece of area. This is our second case study on imperialism. The other one was on uh, the British Raj. The next one we're going to do is on Latin America. Imperialism, if you forget, is when one country goes in and conquers another country and forces their beliefs and steals all their resources. Horrible time in human history, treating people really bad. A lot of racism going on um, with Europeans going around and conquering people. So here's our little contextualization. First of all, just in terms of sub-Sahara, Sahara Desert's right here. So any area beneath here is considered sub-Saharan. Just a reminder, too, that sub-Saharan Africa, Africa as a whole is very diverse. Um, a lot of people in the West kind of lump people in Africa together into one big group, but it's a huge piece of land. There's a lot of diversity, and I put this map up here. This is a modern map just showing the diversity of different cultural or ethnic groups in Africa. So each of these little dots here is a different ethnic group, and it's very, very diverse. Um, People in different regions don't fit together in terms of language and religion and cultural um, aspects of them. So it's very diverse, which is important just to keep in the back of your mind as we go forward here. Um, also, in terms of the European connection to this, in the previous time period of European exploration of 1450 to 1750, we did talk about West Africa selling slaves to the European slave traders um, and in return getting guns and allowing some local areas to build up empires. The specific one that we referred to was the Asante Empire, which is going to last um, and eventually become Ghana in the 19, uh, 1940s and 50s. So we do have empires around in this time period, and you can see a bunch of different empires um, all on this area. We have Europeans who've set up areas along the coast, um, specifically as, as trade areas along the Swahili coast here. If you remember Swahili, blend of Bantu and Arabic. We're doing lots of review here. How about that? Giddy up. Um, also, we got the Europeans down here. Um, who set up an area right here where they're going to it's kind of like the midpoint between asia and europe and then along the west coast here we have some trade center so there is areas the europeans have not really gone to the interior uh the europeans aren't used to the one there's issues of terrain the area internally here this area here is like large a lot of rainforest in this area a lot of dense jungle also the europeans found that when they did try and enter the interior they were often um, destroyed by mosquitoes and those mosquitoes often carried malaria which um, the Europeans got very frequently as a result of this. So a lot of Europeans who tried to go inside um, into the internal parts of sub-Saharan Africa ended up dying. But all that changes in 1750, or really 1800, because we have access to the Industrial Revolution. And because Western Europe is industrialized, they have new medicines that are going to be invented. Remember, we talked about the chemical side of the Second Industrial Revolution in Unit 5. And we have better transportation. We have just better boats that can navigate rivers. We can eventually build railroads, which can transport goods. And this makes it easier to do this. So because of European industrialization, plus better weapons as well, don't forget that, we're going to have the Europeans are going to be allowed to kind of or be able to enter um, into Central uh, Africa as opposed to what they could do before. The person who jump starts this is King Leopold II. He is the king of a small little country called Belgium. It's right smack dab. Um, in Western Europe, it's uh, it's very small, and he, it's an industrialized country. And he essentially goes into this area here called the Congo, which this is the modern map of Congo, but it's a huge swath of land, and it's about eighty times. This area here is about eighty times larger than Belgium. And if you think about that, that's crazy to think about. A little tiny country um, going in and trying to what they're going to do is try and colonize this big area. But Leopold can't just go in with soldiers and try and conquer it. So Leopold comes up with a plan. Essentially, he goes has his representatives, representatives, his diplomatic representatives, go into the king of the Congo and say, hey, king, I know you have a problem with, with slaves being captured from your area. Why don't you let me bring my soldiers in? I'll come in and stop this slave trade. And in, as a, like a response to this, what I would like for you is just to open up trade with me and kind of negotiate like kind of a monopoly on trade with the Congo. And Congo is has a lot of rubber, rubber trees. Also, it has a lot of natural resources. So the Belgians have an idea. And the king of the Congo is kind of like, all right, like that sounds like a good deal. Like I'm losing so many people. The population is decreasing. I'm going to trust you. Let's sign this agreement and handshake, sign the paperwork. We're all good. So the king, the king of Belgium sends his soldiers in. And when he gets there, the first thing he does is arrest the king of the Congo. And he takes over. So the 
Belgians go in and conquer this region. Um, they are going to have the people of the Congo harvest rubber that is needed for their factories. Because today, in modern day times, today, we can produce rubber through synthetic material, through chemicals. Back then, you needed the rubber, which comes from the sap on trees, in order to make this rubber. And it's not found in Europe at all. So... As a result, the Belgians are going to go in here and really treat the Congolese people. This is probably, I put on here, this is the worst thing that you've never learned. The Belgians go in and treat these people um, in the Congo horrifically awful. It is one of the most outrageous treatment of people um, in, the, in the late 1800s, up until a lot of the genocides that we talk about in the 20th century. They, there's an estimated death toll as a result of Belgian Congo. Um, conquering the Congo is estimated at five to 10 million people. That's just in the Congo. That's about the same number of people who are going to be killed during the Holocaust. Now, this is over a larger period of time. We're not talking a three or four year period here. We're talking over a couple decades, but it's really horrific. So they're going to force people in the Congo to go out and harvest rubber to find natural resources. And if they don't, if they rebel, if they don't harvest what they're supposed to, um, they chop off hands. Now, this is what the harvesting looks like. You cut into the bark of the tree and the sap drains out and it comes into this bucket. Then you need to melt that uh, sap down so you can make it into the shape that you want. Think of a tire shape or whatnot. Um, but these are the people who are going to be, this is just one photographic evidence of kind of these, the chopping of hands. You can see that the people in this picture range in age of probably pretty old here, almost like a grandmother um, to a little child. So really horrible. Plus, this is just the, chopping of the hands off. We have torture. We have going in and slaughtering villages who rebel. Um, we see some really, really horrifically awful stuff uh, to the Congolese people. Also, one thing, that, again, you probably never heard of this. The Belgians are going to have zoos in which the Congolese people are brought to the zoos and basically treated like animals um, in these zoos. So you can see this little girl here. This is in the 1960s, or this is probably the 50s, actually. This picture right here is from the 50s. This is a little girl who's in a zoo, and white people are coming to touch her and give her, like, food and kind of gawk at her and watch her in her natural habitat. Again, social Darwinism is a huge player here, where you're not looking at people from the Congo as human beings. They are animalistic. They are closer to chimpanzees. Also, you have a person here who's in this little like self-made lake here and the, the people around here. Don't get too judgy on this. Um, the United States also had zoos for humans. There was a zoo in the Bronx Zoo um, for, for uh, human beings in, 19, in the early 1900s. So this is gonna happen all around the world. The Belgians are kind of the worst with this in terms of treating of the Congo. It's like the most, probably the horrifically awful example. After the Belgians conquer, other countries in Europe are like, it's competition, right? There's nationalism. Um, they did it. We want to do it too. And we have this what's called scramble for Africa. And the Europeans who want to avoid a war meet together, 14 countries, and they decide to have a discussion about how do we conquer this whole continent without going to war with each other. And 14 countries from Europe, no African leaders present, meet in Berlin and have what's called the Berlin Conference in 1884. And essentially they decide... If you build an embassy in this region and you plant your flag, the land is yours as long as you let the other countries know first. So over the course from 1880, this is the European influence in uh, Africa. So you can see everything's on the coast. And then in 1883, 1882, 83, the Congo is conquered by the Belgians. And by 1900, this is what has happened. So we've gone from just coastal areas to the colonies, the all of Africa essentially becoming a colony of Europeans. There's two exceptions. One is Liberia here. This was a, an area on the West Coast set up for former slaves to return back to Africa. Not very popular. Also, we have Ethiopia or Abyssinia here, which is also going to successfully rebel and fight back against the Italians in the one example of Europeans losing to Africa, to an African region, and the Ethiopians successfully beat the Italians and... Um, kick them back. There's more to come on that when Mussolini in Italy tries to take back over Ethiopia or take them over in the 1930s. But another story for another day. Um, if you look at this, the big winner looks like France, but most of this is the Sahara. The really big winner is Britain, the first to industrialize. They take over a lot of land. So in terms of Britain, I just want to switch gears out of Congo. One other main area I want to talk about, because we're going to get into this in the 1900s, is South Africa. South Africa, huge resources there. 
The Dutch had been here since the 1600s. They had set up an, a coastal area and a colony on the coast because, again, it was the midway point between their colonies in Indonesia and their trade with Japan. If you remember the Tokugawa Shogunate, the Dutch are there, and the Netherlands. So they set it up on the coast. During imperialism, the British come in and conquer it. And they want to conquer this because there's a lot of gold there. There's a lot of diamonds. And essentially, they create kind of a couple different states within South Africa. One is called, this is this area is going to be run by the British because the British beat the Dutch. They also set up the Orange Free State here, which is for the Dutch. Um, the term Orange refers to Protestantism, specifically in the Netherlands. If you know the Syracuse University, their nickname used to be the Orange Men, referring back to this. Now they're just called the Orange. Um, and we also have areas set up for people who are native to Africa, who are not of European descent. And two of these areas that remain localized are the Zulus, this is a certain ethnic group, and the Zosha, who are the other ethnic group. So there's the Dutch, the British, the Zosha, the Zulu, all kind of in what's going to become later this one country. In 1910, so over the period this was separated, in 1910, the British take over this entire area in a harsh, horrendously close to the Congo in terms of horrific brutality. Um, and we're going to see some really, really bad racial discrimination. What we're going to see by the 1930s and 40s is a system, which we're going to get to in Unit 8, called apartheid, in which there's strict racial segregation between whites and blacks. This is going to be a settler colony. British, British people are going to be encouraged to move to South Africa for the opportunities. So unlike, for example, the Congo, where there's very limited Belgian people there, this region is going to have a large um, European population. By large, I mean about 10 to 15 percent of the population here are going to be of European descent, which is a large number of people coming from another place to colonize it. And they're going to take the best land, the best schools, all the resources for the Europeans. Lastly, there is a rebellion in South Africa, and this is a rebellion based on religious ideas. It's not a rebellion where you're taking up guns and fighting. And this is called the Zosha cattle killing. And remember, Zosha is one of the tribes or one of the areas or the, the ethnic group that's in and has kind of their own country. And they've been invaded up until 1910 periodically by the British. And a girl, um, Nankwasu, she decides and her sister leave their village one day. And they're, they're, they're raised by their uncle. And their uncle is kind of this mystical, magical, like religious figure. And they leave the village one day and they claim why they, and when they come back the next day that they've seen a vision. And in the vision, they are told that in order to repel or beat the British, because we can't beat them with weapons, we need to kill all the cattle and burn all the crops. And the gods will smile favorably upon us and push the British back to their, across the ocean, back to their area. And the sun will turn red and we'll know that we've won. And for some reason, the local tribal people believe these two kids and their vision. As a result, they are going to kill, the Zosha are going to kill and slaughter 300 to 400,000 cattle in their country, in their area, and they're going to burn all their crops. This does not work. The British stay. And what I want to point out here is not like, haha, what, what idiots, how do they do this? But more that this is how desperate people are that they're turning to something as what appears to be crazy as killing all their cattle and burning all their crops in order to kick out the British, which shows you they realized they couldn't do it by military means, and it was kind of a last resort or a last ditch effort, but it doesn't work. Um, anyway, that's what we got. That's imperialism in sub Saharan Africa. It's really a harsh treatment, much harsher than we see in India. It's really what the worst in, of imperialism up there with like how horrific slavery it is, a lot of the genocides. This is like a really, really one of those top three or five worst things in the world um, and how people are treated. Anyway, that's what I got. As always, you got any questions, you write it down. You let me know. 